to thank you for uh, the wonderful uh, introduction. Uh, so I'm so thrilled to be with you all uh, today. Uh, you've been hearing lots about diversity uh, from the earlier speakers, from the minister and, of course, uh, from Sir Nick. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work that I've been doing in this area. But first, I want to start with some of the work that art historian, American art historian, Sarah Lewis has been doing. So Sarah Lewis teaches at Harvard University, and she has written recently about the power the arts has in terms of moving society forward and bringing about justice. So one of the stories that she tells uh, is about a man called Charles Black Jr. So in 1931, in Austin, Texas, Charles Black Jr. was a young, privileged white boy on his way to a dance, hoping to meet some girls. So he arrived at the dance and his plans were completely blown apart by what he saw on the stage. He saw a band that would displayed such excellence, excellence that he had never seen before in his life. And in particular, he was mesmerized by the trumpet player and the mastery that this trumpet player displayed over the instrument he was playing. That trumpet player was Louis Armstrong. In that moment, Charles Black Jr. was able to challenge everything that he had been taught as a young boy growing up in Texas in the 1930s. He had been taught that black people were subhuman. He had been taught that they were inferior and less than. But what he saw in the performance of Louis Armstrong made him realize that there was no way that that could be true. And from that moment, he decided that he was going to fight injustice and discrimination. So he would go on to become one of the lawyers on the Brown versus Board of Education case. And that's the case that integrated American schools in 1954. So that moment, that encounter with art, that encounter with art that questioned everything that he believed meant this became possible in America. So another person that Sarah talks about is Frederick Douglass. Now, Frederick Douglass uh, was a freedom fighter. Uh, he was a trusted advisor to Abraham Lincoln. Uh, he was, in his day, uh, one of the most revered orators. And that was a time when orators were the equivalent of what pop stars and sports stars are today. And he gave a speech during the Civil War where he spoke about why art was so important in the pursuit of justice. And what he spoke about was the idea of pictures and progress. And what he believed was that pictures and imagery and art in general was the lens in which we could see what the future could be, or more importantly, what the future should be. So I want to talk to you a little bit about myself and my journey. So I grew up uh, in Walthamstow. Is there anyone from Walthamstow here today? Oh my goodness, hi, there's like two in the audience. Uh, what I want to know is, are you old Walthamstow or are you new Walthamstow? Because, oh, you're new and you're old. Okay, that's good. We've got a bit of both here. Uh, so I am definitely uh, old Walthamstow. Um, and so when I was growing up in Walthamstow, it was one of the poorest communities in London. Uh, I grew up on a council estate, uh, but the wonderful thing there was most of the original community were white working class survivors of the Second World War, and they welcomed families like mine. And we had this real community spirit where everybody was from everywhere. Our market stall uh, was the longest street market in Europe, and you could get anything from anywhere. And the funny thing was the market stall holders all knew us, so you know. In the times where, the, the odd occasion where I was bunked off school, uh, I got uh, <laughs> reported <laughs> to my mother by the market store holders, so I knew not to do that again. Uh, my school uh, was like the working class version of the UN, uh, and what was interested and interesting was when I attended um, uh, this school, it was when the gentrification was beginning to happen in Walthamstow. So you had local kids like myself, um, but then you had a lot of sort of middle class do-gooders that didn't want to send their kids to private school that sent their kids to our school. Probably a few of you in the audience here today. Um, <laughs> and so we had this mix, and what was wonderful about it was we celebrated all of the religious holidays 
we displayed a real unity at that school and difference was considered a good thing. From there, I went on to KISS FM at a time where KISS FM was just becoming legal and the whole point of the radio station was about connecting young people through music and bringing them all together. So when it came to diversity and inclusion and difference, I thought this was something that was second nature to me. From there, I went on to uh, T4 on Channel 4 with Vernon Kay. I'm pleased to say both of us have slightly better hair. Uh, <laughs> not that. So he's like not so sure. <laughs> Slightly better. Um, and again, here, getting to meet people from all walks of life where diversity and difference was an asset. So like most British television talent, I wanted to crack the Holy Grail and move to America. And so I moved there about 10 years ago. And about five years ago, I was filming on set um, and a young man appeared, uh, I was in Las Vegas, and a young man appeared on set who was covered head to toe in tattoos. And I immediately felt uncomfortable around him and intimidated. And he hadn't behaved menacingly towards me or anything like that, but I still just felt really awkward. And it was the elephant in the room. He could sense it and therefore was going out of his way to seem unthreatening and non-threatening. So in that moment, I was able to see this issue from both sides. As a black woman, I've always looked at it as being on the receiving end, as opposed to doing it myself. And I realized that's what happens. When you meet somebody that you perceive to be different to you, and for whatever reason, the wall goes up and the disconnect happens. And so I decided to push through my discomfort. And I went over and I spoke to this young man. And yes, he had had a difficult start in life. He'd made some wrong choices. But fortunately, our sound man was much more open-minded than me and had taken him on under his wing as an apprentice. And I couldn't help but think how difficult it was going to be for this young man to fulfill his potential if even somebody like me felt uncomfortable around him and judged him. And in that moment, I wanted to figure out how to start a conversation around these issues, these uncomfortable issues that we often avoid. And what we have to start looking at, we have to start questioning, is our idea of who should lead and who should follow, whose opinion we value and whose we don't. Because actually, in making sure that those that could fulfill their potential don't, it's not only the young people who aren't being given the right opportunities that miss out, it's also us, because it might actually be this untapped potential that has the solutions to some of the problems we now see ourselves faced with, or some of the untapped pollution and um, untapped uh, talent that could actually create unbelievable forms of art that we have yet to even experience. So what I'm proposing is six degrees of integration, that we move from separation and we take six steps that help us better connect with the other, whatever that other is for you. So the first is to challenge your ism. We all have them. We all have unconscious bias that is hidden within us and often we're even unaware of them, much like myself in the case that I've just mentioned. The second is to then check your circle Look at the people that you choose to interact with. Do they look like you? Do they sound like you? Do they think the same as you do? If that's the case, chances are you'll have a linear outlook, even if you don't want to. In checking your circle, I would hope you'd create a new connection. And in creating a new connection, to change your mind. And then the fifth one I think is really important, because particularly in Britain, we're really uncomfortable with acknowledging difference. And there's nothing wrong with difference. That's where the magic happens. So it's important to celebrate difference. And then the sixth step is to champion the cause. So on the website, diversify.org, you can actually go on there and participate in an ism calculator where you can secretly challenge your ism and no one need know but yourself. So that's the ism calculator. So when I talk about diversity, it's much like what you heard uh, a moment ago from Sir Nick and from the minister. I think we need to look at this issue from a broad perspective. I look at age. Age discrimination is something that we're all so comfortable with in terms of ignoring the views of our young people 
and disregarding our elderly. I look at sexual orientation with all that's happening to our LGBTQ communities. I look at gender, of course, disenfranchised men, and I think disenfranchised men is one of the forms of discrimination that we should all be very concerned by. And where there is a lot of focus at the moment on gender equality, and rightfully so, a lot of institutions and organizations are actually uncomfortable in dealing with what's going on with disenfranchised men in society. And then disability, and of course we are in Britain, so class, class is something that we must address in order to become all that we can be as a nation. So in the book, I have uh, various partners, uh, Oxford University and the LSE, and we did a lot of research. And some of the research that came back, for me, the research on disability was what shook me the most, and, and, and I found absolutely heartbreaking. So in this country, one in five people uh, has a disability. 57% of this group has a mobility disability. And 80% of those with disabilities were not born that way. So this is something that can impact anyone at any time. There are lots of industries that are beginning to get the area of disability and actually looking at the untapped potential within this group right. And I think the arts could definitely learn from what's going on in the tech industry. So companies like IBM, Microsoft and SAP, in particular SAP, have set themselves some serious targets of making sure that their coding team is full of people who are also on the autism spectrum. And so a real good example is IBM, one of the uh, lead on their cybersecurity team, a few years ago was flipping burgers in McDonald's. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But what happened was he was unable to get through the interview process. Fortunately, there was a charity that was founded to deal with this issue. And so this young man is now contributing in such a way in helping to keep their cyber safe. Those with learning disabilities, 1.4 million people in the UK with a learning disability, only 6% are in work. We would never accept this from any other group. And this is an area that those of you that are leaders in our arts can really show the way in terms of making sure that we address this statistic. So I want to go back to what I was talking about earlier in terms of Frederick Douglass and the idea of pictures and progress. So when I was growing up in Walthamstow, old Walthamstow, I was uh, an eight-year-old girl from African, uh, an African background in an area where homosexuality was not something uh, that was celebrated. It was something that was considered wrong. It was con considered wrong in my family, and it was certainly considered wrong in the community I grew up in. But watching EastEnders as an eight-year-old child and seeing Colin and Barry and just, <laughs> and just how mundane and boring that relationship was <laughs> actually normalized homosexuality for me. So even though my outside world was telling me something else, seeing this made me question that this could possibly be wrong, much like what seeing uh, Louis Armstrong did for Charles Black Jr. So by the time we got to this, I was like, oh, this is nothing. <laughs> this is normal at this point. And so this is why it's so important, those of you that are programmers, those of you that create content for our country, a content that travels around the world, content that decides what Britain looks like to the rest of the world, it's so important that you be inclusive. Because this isn't just about making those that are disenfranchised see themselves on screen. This is all about also what it does for the rest of us in terms of what we think those that are discriminated against are capable of, and also in terms of how we value them in our society. So this is one of my favorite actresses at the moment, Adelaide Langdon. Uh, how many of you watched The American Horror Story? Anyone watch it? Oh my goodness. You're going to love this. If you haven't seen it, you must watch it. So it's one of the best shows. And she is one of the best characters in this show. To me, this is somebody who should be an international superstar. Again, 
These are the sorts of things that we need to start making normal as opposed to something that's considered unique. Um, we're looking at the Arts Council and the sorts of organisations that you're beginning to fund and support. And I'm thrilled with the work that you're doing with the Good Literacy Agency, because the Good Liter Literary Agency, because it's so important that voices from unheard communities actually get the platform that they deserve. I'm so excited to see the kind of talent that will be discovered and the kind of talent that will be nurtured as a result of this collaboration. Some more of the other research that we've done is looking at the actual cost of discrimination because we know the social argument, we know the moral argument, but we are a capitalist economy and so we actually have to look at the economic argument and it's expensive to discriminate. Uh, the LSE did a recent study and the cost to everybody else uh, who is not uh, a white man in society is 127 billion pounds a year. And that's the equivalent of 9,300 pounds each. So one of the areas that we are all dreading and not looking forward to is Brexit. But at the same time, Brexit offers us the opportunity to look at who we are now going to start nurturing. Forgotten communities, the communities that felt left behind by globalization. The arts can have a key role in redesigning how these communities see themselves, but also the opportunities that these communities are given. So diversity, if we're honest, it's not easy, particularly if you're looking at organizations. It's, not, it's important that you don't just do the first bit, which is bodies, it's just getting people who are different into your organizations. The second piece is crucial, which is inclusion. Making sure that the culture is welcoming so people can be all of themselves, be their authentic selves in the workplace and within your organizations. So I'm gonna end with this, and this is one of my favorite quotes. Uh, it's by Thomas Berry. And he says, diversity is the magic. It is the first manifestation, the first beginning of the differentiation of a thing and of a simple identity. The greater the diversity, the greater the perfection. And I think those of us that are in the arts really have the opportunity to lead on this. And so I say to you all, when you go back to your organizations, do an actual audit. Look around your organizations. Where are those gaps? How can you fill them authentically? And in doing so, create institutions, content that actually moves society forward and makes us all feel that we belong and are part of the fabric of this country. So thank you very much. <laughs>